This episode of Skirmish Supremacy is brought to you by Reformation Brewery, the official beer of your game night. I'm making infinity tokens because uh, we spend so much goddamn. I spent so much, so much goddamn money on infinity stuff. Like I would like to have nice tokens, but every time I went to go buy tokens, I was like, N- you know, maybe you should cool it on buying it, buying stuff for infinity. You bought a new mat, you bought a whole bunch, a whole table's <laughs> worth of terrain. You bought like three hundred dollars of miniatures. Maybe you don't need tokens. Yeah. Well, you kind of need a shitload of tokens for infinity. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah you, you do. do. And you can't use just like generic tokens either. No, no, no they have to be very specific. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's not like you can just uh, like in Relic Blade in the box, you have that one token that is kind of like a crosshairs, is kind of like you know, it, it's like what is this token? <laughs> and Sean just likes to smile when people ask him, "What is this token?" Just smiles and goes, "It's a token." <laughs> and so if you get you know. If you if you get poison or you know any of those random things, you just throw that out there on the character, and you're like, yeah, you know, it, it's this token. Good enough. <laughs> it's a token <laughs> because he has all you know. He has he has all the other tokens basically covered. Yeah, but no, in Infinity, you need a token for for orders for different kinds of orders well, and yeah different orders in different pools different yeah you're at different types of orders whether it's impetuous or frenzy or irregular or you know um a lieutenant order and there's command tokens and then all kinds of shit you kind of have to mark yeah and then like a token just to say hang on a second i gotta go to the bathroom because <laughs> <laughs> you can't just say that no that needs to be a token on the table <laughs> yeah, so I'm making these tokens out of. Uh, I printed them off. Um, I, they have a really cool token builder. Infinity is like dripping with uh, fan made um, uh, support materials. But I, I went to the uh, token builder and I printed off these sheets of tokens onto uh, cardstock. And I'm like, all right, well, I can glue these onto something else. But I didn't want to cut out circular tokens because um, need, you need like a bazillion of them. Um, and so I got this one inch uh, craft punch that just punches one inch circles, uh, which is great. But it's it's like slightly bigger than my wooden one inch uh, tokens, so they don't really like fit on a one. <laughs> There's like a little overhang, and so I'm like ah, I can't glue them on these. So what I've been doing is I've been I punched out a bunch of circles of Manila folder, and I'm gluing, super gluing three pieces of Manila folder together um, with the same punch, so they're all the exact same exact same shape and size, and then gluing the. Uh, printed out token on either surface. So I have double sided tokens so they don't get confusing on the table. Um, and it, it's actually pretty nice. It's a nice light, but stiff little tokens. It's uh, it's good, but nice. it, uh, it takes a bazillion, you know, tokens. So <laughs> yeah, I suppose we should probably introduce ourselves here. Oh shit. Rambling for a minute. That's all right. All right, folks, welcome back to another <laughs> episode of Scrum Supremacy. I think this is episode 116. One, some, it's in the hundreds. And uh, tonight we're joined by Benson Green from Mind Worm Games. He is over there gluing together, obviously, Infinity Token, since we were just talking about it the last yeah. five minutes. Nick is um, painting something. Relic I Blade. Think. Relic Blade. And I'm just sitting here like an asshole. So, yeah, folks. Like usual. <laughs> That's besides the point. But uh, <laughs> tonight we're going to have another hobby bench. We're just going to be talking about some other stuff going on kind of out in the hobby world and what we're working on and projects and things like that so yeah feel free to Just change the channel i guess decided to make it a three-way mm, yeah yeah spice well, things up a little bit and i appreciate that because I, I have a lot of hobby projects actually in progress right now because we're um we're working on a lot of stuff for my room games behind the scenes but uh i i made a commitment at the beginning of this year to uh do more hobby stuff just for me and not just uh for my room games nice uh, so i've got a lot of stuff uh going on right now um we just started a, a, a campaign for Dracula's America, which has been pretty fun. Um, it's by uh, it's an Osprey product. Yes, um, it's, uh, and, you know it's a, it's a, it's very very fun. Um, 
it runs a little slower than I'd like, um, but just because I, I can't do anything the easy way, uh, I designed a whole custom narrative campaign system because that's a campaign system which works out very, very well. The um, post battle campaign uh, uh, roster management campaign system um, is, is sort of like a really crunched down version of Mordheim or any other GW specialist game. So it'll be very familiar to people who are used to playing those kinds of games. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, setup for a story. They're basically like the campaign system is like, okay, play six games and whoever has the most points at the end wins. I was like, well, I want to do more of a story. So uh, uh, I started talking with the guys that were, uh, who wanted to be in the campaign and we came up with all the, this narrative that we wanted to do. And uh, I went to the border town burning Mordheim uh, a homebrew campaign system. And I kind of borrowed a lot of concepts from that. And we morphed that into a whole custom campaign system for uh, Dracula's America and we, uh, we just started playing through it. Uh, we're on our third game this Friday. We're doing once a month. So it's uh, very easy to, to actually get it done. <laughs> uh, we're only playing once a month. Nice. That's uh, one of the games that Nick and I have on the table to play. And, you know, I, I don't know. I really want to try the multiplayer version because the game seems like it really lends itself well to the multiplayer aspect. Yeah, it does. It's uh, uh, the rules are really uh, really simple, and uh, it handles multiple uh, posse's on the table. The posse's is your your war band or whatever. Multiple posse's on the table really really well. The uh, the one hiccup in the rules is that um, uh, if two players you activate models by playing cards out of a hand, playing cards, uh, and uh, the rule is that if two players play the same card in the same turn, um, a, a special thing happens. So. It, you know, it's like a, that, like a monster comes on the table or some, you know, some wandering events you have, like you have in, uh, in Ragnarok. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that, but it's very rare because you have to play the exact same card. Um, but when more people are playing, if any two cards match, then a special thing happens. So it can get a little bit more crazy. There's like eclipses and, you know, ghosts wandering out of the swamp and shit. Ghosts wandering out of the swamp. Yeah. That just sounds like it's, uh, yeah, Nick, we need to play this game. I need to get my werewolf. <laughs> I need to get my natives done. We all, well, I've got a bunch of cowboys painted up already, but yeah, I definitely, because I really want to play Warrior Nation in this one. What I like about it is that, um, well, or two things. Skin really walkers. Like um, the first thing is that the rules are easy enough that uh, I can play with my seven year old. It's his yeah. first war game, which is really cool. Um, and he knows all the rules. Like the it, last time we were playing, uh, a buddy of mine brought his son over. And uh, we gave him a ringer posse. And uh, Yayan is my son. Uh, Yayan taught him the rules. They set up the whole table. They did the whole thing. I just I played my game, and I'm like, oh, great. He's going nuts. I've, I've got him trained. He's he's now teaching the rules to somebody else. He's good to go. <laughs> um, so it's it's simple enough that uh, a seven-year-old can not only learn it and play it properly with no supervision, they can actually teach the rules. So that's what's great about it. And then the other nice thing about it is that um, it's very casual in the sense that um, you know, like in a GW game like Necromunda or Mordheim or especially Gorkamorka, uh, if, if something bad happens, like if you have a bad game, it can really trash you for the whole campaign. You spend a lot of time trying to get back, uh, get your shit back together. You're trying to build up resources to hire back people to make your posse uh, up to snuff. Whereas in Dracula's America, uh, one of the cool things is that most posses uh, have, like, or factions, I guess, most factions have like a, uh, a you know a certain number of special dudes like the the vampire faction. Two of your guys are vampires, right? And they have, right. A, they, have a, they have a template that's like here's a vampire template. But the nice thing is that if your vampire dies, you just pick a guy in your posse and you're like you're a vampire now because I always get two vampires. Now you're right. a vampire. And if your if your warlock dies, whatever, you're a warlock now, dude. All your experience, all your stuff, whatever, you're a warlock. If your boss dies, you pick another model. You're the boss now. Um, so it's really forgiving of, uh, of model death, uh, which is nice. It yeah, is. is that also true of the wizards? Cause I thought the wizards, if like someone kills off, like your, uh, I think that, what do they call them? Arcanists? Yeah. Arcanists. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh it's whatever your special thing is from your posse. So for example, I play the dark confederacy. Um, and so, uh, what you get is a master necromancer. So, uh, one model in your posse, when you first build your posse is a master necromancer. Um, if your master necromancer dies, you pick another model on your posse, and he is now a master necromancer because you always have a master necromancer. Gotcha. Okay. So right. if if you if you give someone a, like a, if you make someone else an arcanist and they die, you don't get them, right? But um, you always have your special thing that makes your posse special, which is kind of nice. So unlike in 
uh, like uh, Frostgrave, if you're if you're I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't played Frostgrave. I've read the rules. I haven't actually played it, but uh, I think it, if your caster dies, it can be really, be a really big deal in Frostgrave. Right, because your your apprentice will take over, but you lose a bunch of stuff if he does, because he's always lower level than the than the wi- the wizard, you know, than his his boss was. Yeah, whereas in Dracula's America, you just pick somebody else in your posse. So you're like, okay, Jimbo, who is a hero and has like five skills um, and has all this cool gear, you are now the master necromancer, poof. And yeah. you just keep playing. And you hire another guy, and in two games, that new guy is now probably a veteran or a hero with a bunch of skills. Um, so models die, but then you just replace them. And what we've been doing, at least what I've been doing, is um, uh, I just, uh, when a model dies, I just take the same miniature. And I'm like, okay, I'm hiring another female Native American scout. <laughs> and look at that. Fantastic. Yeah. Her, your name is now Sarah. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim that, had a brother, Clem. That that makes me think of uh of you know when Ash plays games like that and someone dies and you know he's like not painting something else do. So he's like, yeah, so uh, we just hired somebody else. They're so-and-so's cousin. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah, you know, that's actually, so, um, you know, talking about campaign systems and, you know, kind of, you know, making sure you don't fall behind. Um, I started a campaign recently with uh, Relic Blade, mm-hmm. and... You know, I hadn't really paid attention to, you know, like I've done the missions before, but I've never paid attention to, you know, if you're playing a campaign, you know, some of the, some of the after parts of the mission. Um, And I, you know, I realized, you know, when we started the campaign and started playing that, you know, you, you basically both end up getting something out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know like you get like an equal amount of experience or influence as it's called in there uh and then the winner gets a little bit of extra stuff um but you know um even if you end up fighting you know like having a wandering monster like the uh the fey knight or the green knight come on in the fey forest and he you know goes chasing after you to go murder you you know you could be on the losing team and kill him and still end up with better treasure than the other guy because you killed, you know, the green knight. Um, and, and yeah. I, I really, I really like that because, you know, it did keep that, you know, that balance of, you know, the winner, winner still gets, you know, more stuff overall per the scenario, but, you know, I don't fall so far behind that I can't catch up. Sure. Yeah, I think that's important in a lot of campaigns. That was actually uh, something that I worked really, really hard on in order to make sure that nobody ever felt like, okay, I've lost two games and now I might as well just play to make sure I'm not last with Ragnarok. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> that was something that like, it, it it took me a while to get down to kind of where I wanted it. And it's hard. It's not easy to get to strike that kind of balance because there's in a campaign system, there's always a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're going to have, we're talking about games of dice. You know, you're always going to have that time where it's like, tactically, everything you're doing is correct. And on averages, you should be winning until you roll snake eyes, you yeah. know, or whatever, whatever it is. It's just, it's going to happen. So, and if you're not playing a campaign, it's like, all right, big deal. We'll play another game. And we both now have equal point values. It's a straight up fight. Whereas in a campaign, you're like, oh, like in Gorka Morkas, that is the, one of the biggest uh, um, uh, culprits of this. Like if your truck blows up in Gorka Morka, you are effed. Yeah, campaign because now I've got to sit there with my guys. You know, I got to buy a jalopy truck, and then I got to put all my teeth into that. Meanwhile, you've now bought a second truck, or you souped your truck up super, uh, super awesome. And next time we play, you blow my truck up again because I have a shitty truck, and you have an awesome vehicle. And then yeah. the cycle continues. And so those kind of games, there's a lot of those GW specialist games. You need a game master to kind of ba- break the rules of the, of the of the campaign and kind of you know move things back into a, a more of an even footing, so everybody can have fun because it's not fun to go into a game being like, oh, "I'm going to lose this one." Right? Yeah, because yeah, it, it, you notice that with a lot of the the games that have like more of the progressive systems, is that if somebody's won, you know, if you've lost three and somebody's won three, 
And if you, even if you have like 10 players, that person that's won three in a row compared to you that's lost three, if you ever go up against them, like they're pretty much going to annihilate you. There's almost nothing you can do. Yeah. You know, you, all you can do at that point is just hope that they have a bad dice day. That's it. <laughs> Or, you know, if you have a system in place in the campaign, that it's like an underdog system where I'm going to get creamed in this fight, but I'm going to come away with it, away from it with a lot of extra stuff that I would normally not get. Um, and it's now going to bump my my crew up to a, a, more, a more equal footing for the next game. Um, so how did you manage it in Ragnarok? I haven't read the rules because it's not released yet. Yeah, right. Correct. Um, so the way that I did it is it's it's based off of an average war clan strength. So if you ever so it does a couple different things it allows for people to jump into the game with like brand new war clans against somebody who's had three four games under their belt you oh, know even ten, even 10 or 12 so you can be like hey jimmy you should play in our campaign and he's dithers for a few months and you're like no, no no you really should play he can jump in and be like all right i've got a clan that's about on par with what you guys are playing with. yeah so the way that it works is you're gonna start so everybody starts the game with an 800 val- an 800 uh, glory war clan. Glory is kind of like the catch all for experience, money, stuff. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah, resource. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody starts with an 800 glory war clan, and then after every game, based upon wins, loss, and everything else in between, your your glory will go up. You spend that glory to include it to improve your war clan members. Um. And so what ends up happening is even though you're spending the glory, you still always keep track of like how much you've gained Mm -hmm. over the course of a game. So like, yeah, you might have gained 400 glory and spent it all. Well, you still have a 1200 glory war clan. So the way that it works is that if you are the underdog or if you're new jumping into the campaign, um, you actually will get bonuses just for playing against people that are more powerful than you. Yeah. So there's a chance. Yeah. The, the first couple of games, you're probably going to get your teeth kicked in. But by playing against the more powerful war clans, you're actually going to gain more glory to be able to kind of catch up to what the war clan average is. So, yes, you're always going to have those, you know, maybe one or two people that are slightly better than everybody else. But that just means that they don't get any bonuses for going against those that are weaker than them. Yeah, it, um, it's basically a you know like taking the place of a, of a game master um, because yeah. it, so it's a self leveling uh, principle. Yeah, well, and on top of that too, based upon you know what you get for gear can also have a significant difference in that. Like in the first book, and I, I can actually talk about this now. So yay, um, the most powerful weapon in the book that you can get, and you you have to find it. You can't purchase it. Is actually Thor's hammer. Thor's dead, but his ha- Mjolnir is still out there. So if you get Thor's hammer, like that's going to be a significant boost to your war clan value just for having a friggin' hammer. Sure. So, you know, when you, when you have stuff like that in the game, it's like, yeah, I might've lost, but I rolled really well on my, on my rating and ended up finding Thor's hammer. So, you know, great for me. <laughs> so it, it's it's got a couple different ways to kind of keep everything in track and then in the book too you just kind of determine like okay are we going to play 10 full games and the person with the highest uh you know glory at the end of this is the overall winner or are we going to create something where it's like we have to meet these criteria in order to win and i kind of leave it up to the groups sure. because every every campaign group is different as much as i want to do like epic pseudo dungeons and dragons games i know that not everybody has the time to play those yeah nobody not everybody has time to uh <laughs> write a 50 page custom campaign for, for, their, simple, <laughs> for their simple wild west war game <laughs> yeah it works for you though it was very fun to write <laughs> yeah and now does that mean that i don't plan on doing those absolutely i want to write like some big narrative really cool stuff you know it's my fucking game. I should be able to do that. Yeah. But the point of it is, is that for the core book, I wanted to just give people the, the ability to, you know, one, create their own sagas and two, you know, play it how they want. Like what's mm-hmm. fun for them in a campaign? Is it just, they want to do it like a tiered tournament system? Do they want to actually like go through and do everything the way that I say it can, should kind of be done, but I'm not going to be the one to say this is the official way to do it. Sure. So yeah, that's kind of how I handle it. In a very long drawn out fashion. <laughs> so we're doing, uh, like I said, we're doing Dracula's America, and then 
We're also uh, we've been doing grunts, which is a it's an okay system. Have you heard of it? It's like a fifteen millimeter generic uh, uh, sci fi yeah, yeah. war game. Yeah, yeah. I think that what is it? Grunts and then or is it just grunts or because I also heard of star grunts too? Or is that different? I don't know. Star grunts, I think, might be associated with it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't recall it right off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're doing grunts, um, which. Uh, it's uh, it works really really well if you write your own scenarios. Um, uh, I was like sort of underwhelmed playing it. Uh, it's fun to build armies, and it's fun to you know do fifteen millimeter gaming because it's really easy to paint fifteen millimeter. Um, uh, but uh, I was a little underwhelmed until uh, my buddy Aaron started writing his own custom scenarios, and uh, uh, he's been doing a really great job with that, and uh, it's been a blast. Because um, one of the things about it is that. For the first uh, few times playing uh, the scenarios right out of the book, uh, I was like, why do you have grunts? Like, why, why would I not just buy all tanks? Um, uh, because a lot of the scenarios didn't really put grunts forward. So you started writing these scenarios where you had to have people on the ground to take objectives and hold terrain and stuff like that. Uh, and once you started adding in those elements, I'm like, okay, well, I've got to have a bunch of grunts, guys. Well, now I need some, you know, troop transport for them, whether it's flying or it's a tank or something like that. And now I have that support vehicles. And now I'm like, okay. Now the system is really starting to work because I'm not going to just going to dump all my points into a big super tank with a giant weapon on it and blow everybody up. Now I have to have all these things work together to, uh, to be able to succeed in the scenario. So it's uh, turned out to be really, really fun. Nice. That's awesome. So you said you were also kind of working on some stuff behind the scenes with Mindworm at the moment. Obviously, you're you're taking some time for yourself. but Yeah. Yeah, we are working on some stuff. We had uh, Exiles is having a um, – bit of an issue right now because we had a big data loss problem at the end of last year so we're still rebuilding from that um I mean, yeah no it's my it's my stupid fault <laughs> i was working too fast um and i uh, didn't have my backups in uh, in order and then of course i'm on a stupid um uh imac with a fusion drive and a little did i i guess i knew but i didn't really think about it the fusion a lot of the fusion drive is in solid state um, and when my backup failed, I was like, eh, it's all right. It'll be okay. And then the computer crashed and, uh, I brought it in to fix it to like, you know, forensically recover the drive. And the guy's like, yeah, the fusion drive is solid state. And I was like, oh shit, really? I was like, well, I mostly just need to last like few months. He's like, yeah, that's what's in the solid state. Like, Great. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we're rebuilding from that, but we're also working on a bunch of new games, um, that hopefully we will, re- we will release at some point. Um, it's just a matter now of figuring out, you know, like when to release them and uh, what format to produce them in and, you know, where, where's the funding going to come for that. Um, so we, uh, uh, that's what we have in progress. We have a, a new game um, that we're calling Swipe Wrong. It's like a, a, a card game about uh, online dating. And then <laughs> uh, we have a game called Deers and Doors, which is uh, uh, my partner, John, has designed a, uh, a roguelike card game where you're, uh, you are a group of deers and you're adventuring through a dungeon that's filled with like, you know, animated uh, vegetables and, uh, and hunters that are trying to kill you. Um, so we're, uh, we're polishing up the rules on that. And then we have our role-playing game, Horse the RPG, which is ready to be released. We're just figuring out when we're going to release it and what, uh, what print format to do it in. Um, that's always a big thing when, with, with printed materials is figuring out, you know, how we're going to print it and what it's going to look like. Because um, it's uh, part of the joke, with uh, horse the RPG is that it's uh, supposed to be sort of like evoking a really low budget, uh, do it yourself, um, homebrew system. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at different ways to, uh, to make it look like it's manufactured, um, in like a cheap, uh, like indie press sort of way without, uh, without actually it being cheap and shitty. <laughs> so we're trying to solve that, uh, uh, that problem. Um, so we got a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and, and we have new Exiles products that eventually we, we will release at some point. So I, I figure we're probably going to relaunch uh, in, in the fourth quarter this year, maybe around Christmas. We'll hopefully have all the Exiles products restocked and then have some new products released and then have a few new products uh, coming out. And then I'm revamping the website and that's always fun. <laughs> so behind the scenes, I'm like tinkering with, you know, you know, new uh templates and custom coding and all kinds of bullshit to make our website look, look, look better for a company that has more than one product. (laughs) (laughs) The current website is, is kind of like was designed when I didn't know anything about web design and um, it was mostly designed for exiles. Um, And now that we're getting ready to release these other products, I'm like, Oh shit, 
Um, this whole website looks like it's, you know, made for exiles. I kind of need to take a step back and, uh, and design something that has a, a more generic look and then have product specific landing pages that have all the information about the products. And, it's, and then you can do the exiles page with all the yeah. exiles. -ness. Yeah. So that's, that's all happening. And that's a, a bunch of work behind the scenes. And that's why we're a little cold on social media right now. Cause I figure we'll just, we'll be a grand rebirth yeah. at some point. <laughs> It's like, no, we didn't die. <laughs> yeah, and then we're also uh, we're also working on um, a six millimeter combined arms mech game. It sounds like we're working on a lot of stuff, but Deers and Doors is basically done. We're, we're fiddling with the rules, and Horse RPG is in the can. We're we're working on some new scenarios and supplements for that. Um, Swipe Wrong is done. Um, uh, we just need to take the artwork from the concept stage and and, and do it. So you know that's but that's. Yeah, that's not that's not me. You know, that's John's doing that. So he has plenty of time to do that. Um, so it sounds like we're working on a thousand things at once, but it's a lot of stuff is actually done or, or, or very advanced stages in the production pipeline. Um, Mecha Bitch is at a very early stage in the production pipeline, uh, but we are working on a six millimeter combined arms mech game, which is sort of based off of the Exiles engine. Um, that should be super fun. One of the things we're doing for that is teaching ourselves how to sculpt six millimeter miniatures, and that's <laughs> that's another thing we're doing behind the scenes is uh, teaching ourselves to uh, to sculpt tiny, tiny stuff because nice. we want to produce it all in house. As I told I told well, the guys I was like, if we're doing Mecha Bitch, we're doing it all in house. Every every damn thing, all the art, all the miniatures, everything in house. Yeah, well, nice. you mentioned you mentioned in the past that you've had some issues by sending stuff elsewhere. So at this point, ah. you're just like. There's always issues with that, um, and every company deals with it, and I don't mind. I mean, I like, I like working with artists. There's a bunch of great people we work with. Patrick Keith is wonderful to work with. Um, but from um, from a uh, from a cost perspective and a risk perspective, since we have like putting swipe rods in, horse RPG, uh, so from an investment perspective, it's a lot safer to do everything in-house. Yeah. Um, because uh, it's one thing to spend your time, it's another thing to spend your money and hire somebody else because then now you sort of have to do something with it. Whereas if you spend your time and you're like, oh, okay, it's not working out. Um, we, you know, well, we might do something with this later or let's drop it. It's not a huge, it's not a huge problem because we haven't invested, we haven't over invested in the art assets. Right. Um, and then the flip side, it doesn't have to sell very well um, because we don't have a lot of investment tied up into it other than time. Right. So if we, if we sculpt the whole range or our plan is to sculpt, a small bit of the range and then say, you know, go here and here and here and here for other miniatures and then release miniatures as we go uh, to fill out the range. Um, but if we sculpt something in house and cast it up ourselves and put it on the website, honestly, it doesn't matter if anybody buys it because I can, I can cast 10 units, right? Uh, I can yeah. spend like an hour in the machine, an hour in the shop, cast up 10 units, put it in a box, put it on the shelf. If somebody buys it, great. If somebody doesn't buy it, eh, Whatever. I don't have to be like biting my nails going, how do we remake? How do we recoup all the expense, all the money we put into this? It's just, uh, it's just time. And it's time right. well spent because we're practicing sculpting. Right. And if it doesn't work out on that project, you just take that skill and move it on to the next one. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, honestly, um, the other value in it is having new releases. So even if it's just an excuse to tell customers, hey, we're releasing something else. Even if nobody buys it, it's a good uh, good excuse to uh, to put a new post up on the Facebook page. So there's a lot of good reasons for doing it that way, but it also means that um, we are teaching ourselves new skills, which always takes time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And of course, working on anything pretty much by yourself or with a small team of people is can be very stressful at times. Well, yeah, well, we try to. I mean, one of the nice things about Mindworm Games is that uh, I've got a really good team, and it's very small. It's just me, John, and Jesse. Um, but uh, uh, we've never really had any significant problems. Like, we don't have any personality conflicts. Uh, we don't have any. Uh, you know, we're not complaining about like, oh, you're not doing this, or oh, you should be doing this. Um, it's a really easygoing team, and so uh, sometimes our pipeline can get slowed down, but I don't let that bother me, um, and they don't let it bother them. Uh, and so we're really, really chill with each other, which is nice. So, you know, we have Mecha Bitch and we have some art assets developed for that that we put some money into. And we have some concepts kicking around. And at, at one point, we'll, you know, we'll get together and be like, all right, let's spend a weekend and finish Mecha Bitch. And it'll be done. Nice. 
So how many how many scopes do you think you're going to have off the bat for that? Like, what are you guys kind of thinking now? Uh, we're thinking uh, two fact. Try to get some basic scopes for two factions. Um, uh, obviously, you need your um, your mechs. That would be the most important thing. So, sure. uh, uh, hopefully, we'll have four mechs and then some associated um, uh, options, different weapons, and then some infantry, um, and then uh, uh, expand the range from there. So not much, um, mostly just, you know, uh, hopefully four unique mix with some uh, uh, options uh, and then uh, a couple units of infantry, a couple of different tanks with some different turret options. And then, you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, cards for a lot of different units than that um, with some recommendations for companies. Because there's lots of great companies that make six millimeter stuff. It's a very... Uh, it's a very fertile field. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I don't mind if people use different miniatures. I mean, even for exiles or anything else, you know, use whatever miniatures you want. Um, as long as you're playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I care about. Play the game, enjoy the, enjoy the, enjoy the setting. Um, but uh, exiles is uh, the reason why we're working on these different products is that uh, I want to, I want a stable of products that are easy to manufacture and easy to develop. Um, because Exiles is uh, is a labor of love, and uh, we put a lot of care and attention into every every single Exiles product. So I want something that we can just be like, all right, it's done. Like like, like swipe wrong is it, is going to be in a box? It's done, and we just sell it until it stops selling. Um, and maybe we'll do an expansion. Um, whereas Exiles, every single product, it's like, all right, we're going to do a new campaign, and we need ten thousand words of fiction, and we need twenty different games, and every game has to have all these special rules, and. We need to have, you know, 50 new cards. Every card has to have a new piece of artwork and a new little joke on it. Um, so it's a really intensive process to get something like that done. Yeah, I could I could definitely see that, especially when you're trying to throw that much content into, you know, one IP compared to multiple. You know, and the other thing with this too is you don't want to stagnate and burn out. Yes, and that's another reason why we're taking a little slow right now is that uh, we were we were we were approaching burnout, and I was like, we got to pump the brakes and uh, and take some time for ourselves before we uh, uh, stop doing this all together. <laughs> but uh, no, we're doing good though, um, and uh, hopefully these other products will help support my horrible exiles habit. Because <laughs> it's not a it's not a it's not a like if you if if I wanted somebody to like pitch to like, do an investment pitch for exiles it would not sound very good as far as a a, a marketable product um because it's it's hard to manu- it's hard to develop um it's uh, intense to manufacture because we like it's a lot of hand work it's not a lot of stuff we can uh we farm out to like china or whatever we do we burn all of our tokens by hand i i cut those box dividers by hand um and then um uh it's a uh, it's a sort of mid range uh, it's it, 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 it's not easy to categorize cuz it's like a, it's like a miniatures role playing game or we call it a miniatures action role playing game but it sort of kind of straddles the line between role playing game and miniatures game right and so it's a weird product and it requires like a role playing game it really works best when you have a group that plays and so we have a lot of customers that are just now like bought our stuff 2 years ago and are just now starting to play exiles because they finally got a group together and like okay great everybody has their stuff together we have all, ter- all our terrain built we're ready to play Exiles, um, so it uh, it takes a while to get started, but we'll hit our stride. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, you guys have only been out for a little, you know, about what two years now? Three, yeah, two years. years. Yeah, we're still yeah. really, really young. Yeah, so it's totally fine. I mean, you look at it this way: it's affording you all that time to make Manila tokens for Infinity that you are gluing together. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because I have to have all my. Uh... All my shit, all my uh, all my orders, and all my uh, my unconscious tokens. I need to make a shitload of unconscious tokens. Um, although, luckily, <laughs> that well, doesn't playing, bode well for your gameplay. I, well, I'm playing a remote army. Um, I'm playing mostly remotes because I, the the big barrier for me for Infinity it was always the aesthetic. Um, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of anime. Sorry, people who are fans of anime. I mean, I like it. Um, they're like uh, Akira is awesome. Um, and uh, uh, Evangelion is awesome, and uh, lots of other anime shows are great. But uh, it's not something that like speaks to me. Um, and so a lot of the Infinity aesthetic, I was like, eh, I could take it. It looks cool, but like, eh, it doesn't really like get me going. And then there's a lot of what I call anime ass syndrome in Infinity. Lots of like, you know, really sexy ladies with high heels. You're like, why the fuck you're in body armor? Why are you wearing? Why do you have high heels? Um, which kind of frustrates me from a sort of uh, you know uh, cultural perspective. Um, but the guys were starting to play Infinity last year, 
And so I was like, okay, I'll find a, an army. So then uh, the nomads were good enough for me. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll combat the problem I have with infinity models by doing mostly robots. I mean, uh, mostly just stompy robots and a couple of hot chicks to babysit the stompy robots. Um, so uh, the problem with that, though, is that uh, remotes have two unconscious states. They can go unconscious one and unconscious two. And so that's why I need so many unconscious tokens. Because I've got I have like six remotes. Yeah, I've got six remotes in my 300-point list. Potentially, each one of them could be unconscious too, in theory. I mean, so I don't, I don't need 12 unconscious tokens, but I, I should probably have something like, something like 10, just in case. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> you have that one round where they just EMP everything you have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Um, but my, uh, the, my required number of tokens has gone down significantly since I started learning the rules uh, a year ago. Still haven't played a game, a single game yet. We're going to play on Friday. Um, but my buddies are, uh, are, uh, they decided that, that this was going to be the first game we started playing where every single thing was painted and ready to go. Every model was painted, all the terrain was done. Uh, and so they've been dragging their feet, getting ready for it. Um, but, uh, we've been talking about rules lately and, uh, bounced around army ideas and they're like, Jesus Benson, we got this shit all planned out. I was like, well, you guys said we were going to start playing a year ago. So yeah, I've been reading <laughs> forums for a year. I've been, I've been. I've been writing army lists for a freaking year. I'm ready to play. That's awesome. Yeah, I, honestly, the only thing on my desk right now is, uh, well, more pirates. You guys are crushing uh, blood and plunder. Well, you know, there's times where you want to run an army that's full of nothing but a bunch of cheap sailors, and it's like, I need to make sure I have all of these bastards done. How big is a, is a typical blood and plunder army? Uh, 200 points is the average game size, but Mm -hmm. that could be, call it 30 models, maybe. Oh, all right. So it's a good number of models. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it's, it's kind of smaller than a big war game, but bigger than a a war band game. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And typically at the 30 models, you're looking even, even with that, call it five six units depending upon what you again depending upon what you're running because like if you decide to go like all militia those are three points a piece you're mm-hmm. it's going to take you a while to fill out to you know to fill out to 200 points if you're trying to run like a militia heavy army but at the same time they also like typically stink on ice so you know you're you're you're, pay, you're, you're getting what you pay for which is volume yeah, that's the problem I had with um, Warhammer Fantasy Battles when I started playing that a while ago. I chose vampire counts, and I started putting together my army. And then when I started learning the rules and playing games, I was like, oh, wait, I actually need more zombies and more ghouls than I have in my list because I'm going to be summoning them. Yeah. So now I'm like I'm like painting my, my 60th ghoul, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> <laughs> is, is the game this fun? Well, I mean, you know, that's that's just like any person you know that ever got tyranids. Yeah, and then they got the one of one of the big big ones who you know they're like, oh yeah, it'll be really cool. This thing like spits little gaunts out every round, and then they you know actually play the first game with it, and it is really cool. The first roll when they get like ten gaunts, and then they get their next roll and it's ten more, and their next roll where it's ten more, and they're just looking around like, oh crap. I don't have enough models. <laughs> Somebody please kill these guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're like, no, just murder them. <laughs> because they can feel their their wallet just going, no more guns. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like about Infinity is a low model count. But I tell you, the other thing I didn't know when I started, when I chose to play this remote army, um, I should have asked people before I started buying models um, because the new Infinity models are great. They're three. They're designed digitally, um, and they've got really good uh, part lines, and they get really good, you know, uh, pegs to go in the, in the sockets. Everything fits together nice. Um, but the older Infinity models, oh my god! And the remotes <laughs> are all old. Yeah, they are. They are a chore. Uh huh. They don't go together unless they're pinned. Everything's pinned. <laughs> <laughs> I started with super glue, and I was like, nope, that doesn't work. And then I switched to uh, epoxy. That didn't work. And then I switched to pins with a super with super glue. I'm like, ah, sort of. And then I I, I I cranked it all the way up to pins with five minute set time epoxy. 
<laughs> <laughs> now they're not falling apart. That's that's insane. Yeah, I so my when I started with Infinity, I actually started with the uh the Merovingians, so like all French metros. So it's like a bunch of people in like jean jackets and blue jeans. Mm. So it looks like just like a bad eighties band picked up guns cool. and went to war. Now what I must miss that what what is, is it now? I'm sorry, what was that? You broke up is that it, Sorry, is that something I can play right now? Like, I, I think I've missed that uh, those models in that army. Yeah. So, so you can you can get them, um, but they haven't been updated in a while. No, they haven't. Last not. last that I knew, they hadn't been updated in a while. They're they're up for being updated soon, but you know everything else, Ariadna. That, that and that's where they fall. They, oh, fall Ariadna. Ariadna. Yeah, they are Ariadna. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they're the uh, the kilts and werewolves turn me off of Ariadna. I like I glanced at Ariadna. I was like, okay, maybe I can do Ariadna. Um, and then I, I looked through the models and I was like, nope, kilts and werewolves. Sorry, it's cool, but uh, not, oh. my sci- not my sci fi game. But but that's that's actually only one one faction out of Ariadna. You don't you don't even have to take the Caledonians. That's yeah. like that's like a tiny faction. I mean, granted, the werewolves are everywhere. Yeah, and in the metros, you only get one, and he com- it comes as a pair. It's Margo and Duroc. Uh, so, I hear they're really good. Yeah, so the funny thing of it is, is everybody's freaked out about Duroc because he's got, you know, he, he's, you know, he's a werewolf or whatever they're called, the antipode, you know. So he, and he's like pure blood. So it's like he's got super jump. So he's like, I don't care how tall this building is, I'm still getting to you. I got dual chain rifles, two wounds, you know, yada yada yada. He's really good yeah. in hand to hand combat. He could pretty much rip apart a tag himself. But he's not the dangerous one. Margot is. So you send Duroc into the, like the, the back lines just doing what Duroc does and just looking scary as Margot's actually the one sniping the important models out. Yeah, so. we'll see. We'll see how, uh, how Infinity plays. Um, uh, I, I told the guys, I was like, you're going to have to teach us the rules, Benson. I was like, well, maybe you should read the rule book. Um, and uh, try to familiarize yourself because it's going to be a comedy of errors when you first start. But I was like, the, the biggest problem is not going to be knowing the rules. The biggest problem when we first start is that we're all going to be playing like idiots. <laughs> we're going to be like, oh, wait, shit. I'm at minus nine to your plus six. Oh, crap. Yeah, I guess this model's dead now. Or like, <laughs> oh, wait, I deployed terribly. I have no cover. And you, you, uh, you, uh, like airdropped into my backfield. Oh, shit. Yeah. Like, the first, I, I imagine like the first, like, month of playing infinity is going to be like a bunch of like oh shit why am i an idiot <laughs> moments you move yeah. models you're like oh yeah by the way i forgot that uh you know everybody's got aros and you know <laughs> yeah yeah they can shoot me at any time oh damn it i forgot about that yeah yeah no, i didn't take that into the into my, in my in, i didn't take that into consideration when i was planning out what i was going to do this turn <laughs> or <laughs> like i did my whole turn and I'm like, yeah, I did great. And then I'm like, oh wait, I didn't plan for the reactive turn. Shit. Because <laughs> I've watched, I've watched Ash play. I've watched like every Ash um, uh, Infinity video, um, and so I feel like I, 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 I know what, uh, like what a, a normal game of Infinity looks like, and and I'm confident that our playing is not going to look like that <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> So your recaps are going to be okay. So I messed up this, 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 and this. What did yeah. you screw up? It's not about like your water cooler talk is not about what awesome things you did. It's about oh we screwed this up bad. Yeah, yeah. Unless you know, like some in with Dracula's America, like it's a uh, after every uh, game day, it's like okay, well, um, you were doing that rule a little bit different, a little bit wrong. And uh, so, like, you, you know, you have a limit on their summon models or, you know, this is really how Lookout works. Um, but I think with Infinity, it won't be so much the rules. Because the rule, you know, the rule, the biggest problem with the rules is that they can be sort of hidden because there's, there's, like, nested rules and they can be hard to find in the wiki. Like, uh, martial arts comes with stealth, but it doesn't yeah. say stealth on your on your profile. It says martial arts. So there's some stuff there you might just not be aware of. Um, but the rules are pretty straightforward. Um but I think it's going to be uh, uh, just playing badly, like learning learning how to how to play uh, uh, play well, um, which is uh, uh, going to be a big issue because because uh, you can Infinity seems to be a game where you can really play it badly, whereas like 40k yeah. for example, 
you can be good at 40k. I don't want to. I don't want to like uh, uh, crap on any 40k players. You can definitely be very good at 40k, um, but it is hard to be really bad at 40k. If you put your models on the table and you roll your dice, you know you 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 might lose to a better player, but you know you're not gonna. It's not gonna be like a total pooch screw. Um, yeah. There, there's a very there's a there's very few like really huge game ending mistakes in 40k. Um, whereas Infinity, I keep hearing people say like you can lose a game in deployment. Like what? Really? <laughs> I could deploy my models badly and like you're never going to win now. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of people tell me that where it's like, you could lose in deployment. I'm like, what, how, how do I lose in deployment? Like, did you shoot everybody in some hidden turn that I'm unaware of? You know, like, how did that happen? So, um, but I, I know a lot of it is just like, cause there's so many different ways to come onto the board and everything else that it's like, yeah, if you don't deploy properly, it's like, you could pretty much, have three snipers wreck your day right off the bat. Yeah, and that's what uh, that's what people have said as a problem with uh, running too many remotes is that they have large their large base size and um, uh, they take up a lot of space uh, in their deployment zone, and so it's hard to have them all have cover or whatever, and they can't go prone. And so you know if you don't have first turn, you can get annihilated. So, but you know, um, uh, well, we will definitely no matter what, we will definitely have fun with it, um, uh, and we better because. Uh, I have a whole table that's worth of Bandua terrain and a really beautiful um, game mat. EU uh, double double sided play mat that I got, which is uh, gorgeous. Because <laughs> um, I was overly invested in Western terrain for some reason. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, know why. why. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mystery. Yeah, my my terrain collection for some reason, like I looked at it one day and I was like, oh god, it's mostly West Wild West terrain. And uh, for some reason, my fantasy terrain has vanished. Like it got lost in a move or, or like or got broken. And I never fixed it or it was in like a box in the attics or something like that. Or I gave it to a friend. And so I was looking at my thing and I'm like, I have no sci-fi terrain. And I have very little fantasy terrain. This is going to be like, that's the one thing that, uh, that's been a holdup for uh, Relic Blade is I need to get, I need to rebuild my, my stock of, uh, of fantasy terrain. I need to make like, I need to make castle walls and, and shit. Um, uh, more trees, mushrooms. I need to do. I need to get a mushroom forest or something. Mushroom forests are great. That gravel cast stuff looks awesome. I can't. It I, is. It's on my, it's it on is my list. awesome. Um, those bushes. Uh, that I think I, I think I responded to or I commented on one of your Facebook posts about uh, these bushes. Um, those bushes just come like that, right? You just buy them. They're all painted with like the the, the, the foliage on them and everything. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Jesus, I fifteen. I, I haven't seen them in any other way. So for 15 bucks, that is awesome. Cause they look really good. Yeah, no, I, they do look good. I, uh, I would, I would wholeheartedly, uh, advise you to buy some and I don't even get a kickback for it. <laughs> well, I like them cause they're all scrabbly. Like they're really low and, uh, and yeah. scrabbly. They're, uh, like really, really good for, again, really good for wild west. <laughs> right. Because you can you can take that bush though, and you could put it like in a desert, and you could put it in a forest, and it would look equally good in, in either of those. So I, I like I like terrain that's uh, that's multi-purpose, which is why when I looked at my terrain collection, I was like, oh god, I have a lot of false front, you know, uh, shop buildings and uh, ruined barns and cacti <laughs> and, and outhouses and wagons. I'm like, I've really got a bunch of terrain that doesn't translate very well. Um, to any other period of time ever. <laughs> That's always a rough part too. Cause then you start thinking about how much, like depending upon the games you play, how much money am I going to be investing in terrain? I well, like with, to think about that part with infinity. <laughs> Bandua was running a really good black Friday sale. I got one of their, their whole table of infinity terrains pre-printed. So uh, you just glue it together, stick it on the table. Um, and uh, I got a, it was a really good deal. Like it's because uh, the bundle has a discount, and then they and they they Black Friday the discount on top of that. Um, although what what was weird is that uh, um, I had to actually ask them to extend me the Black Friday deal because uh, I, I saw it advertised, and then I went to go buy it on Cyber Monday because it was an online thing, and uh, they had stopped the deal. And I was like, wait, what is wrong with them? What I mean, what company? Um, does a Black Friday deal that doesn't make, an online Black Friday deal that does not extend all the way to Cyber Monday? <laughs> um, 
but they're not American. It's not an American company. They're Spanish. And so I emailed them. I was like, hey, in America, we typically do Black Friday sales from Black Friday to Cyber Monday, especially if it's online. So could you very pretty please? <laughs> I want to buy this. your stuff, but I mean, I'm still going to buy it, but I really like to have the discount. <laughs> and I feel like an idiot if I didn't, because just because I didn't buy it in that 24 hour period. But they're very, very nice, and they they uh, they they knock the price down. Uh, but yeah, it's a whole table of terrain for like I don't know, 200 something bucks. Really yeah, you cool. can't go wrong with that. Yeah. And then I got uh, uh, Fenris Games um, to plug to plug and sci-fi porta potties. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> sci-fi porta potties. So you go from outhouses to sci-fi porta potties. Well, exactly, right? I'm used to I'm used to playing Exiles and every Exiles game, you gotta have outhouses on the table no matter where you are. Um, and so when I saw those sci-fi porta potties, I was like, that's it, I have to have them. Because now now I'm gonna have my uh, my my required you know porta john on my infinity tables. See, when you were talking about playing infinity, the first thing I thought of was you know, you should have just played Ariadna. Then your Wild West buildings would have fit. You, just, you know what? Shit, you're right. It, they would fit. <laughs> I was like, so when you're like listing all this nomad stuff, I'm like, why aren't you playing Ariadna? Because it's sci-fi. Like, Somebody yeah. else can play Ariadna, and they can have wild west buildings, <laughs> and they can have you know like guys in fatigues with machine guns. I want robots and hackers and stuff. I want, I want uh, info war. Ariadna is too uh, too straight up. It's nice to have it in the mix of the of the different you know armies. It's like because you have different things you can do. Um, but if I'm playing a, an anime forward sci fi game, I want like I want crazy robots with like missiles and laser beams and you know. No, I get it. I get it. I, you said I, info war and then crazy robots, and the first thing I thought is that they need to do a. a, a... A tag of Alex Jones. I don't know why, but <laughs> you said it, and it just like clicked in my brain. I'm like, how do we make this happen? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> that's. Funny. I also went with the uh, with a uh, since we they made a commitment. We all made a commitment to paint all of our models before we started playing. I made sure to go with a uh, a very easy, simple paint scheme um because uh i paint very slowly i don't know if anybody knows that but i paint very slowly um and so i just did uh, uh, a base coat of uh uh, uh neon colors um uh, with an airbrush so they're like really disgustingly bright and then I, I did a little edge highlight on panel lines with uh uh like a little bit of white mixed in with the uh the neon and then i just a, a final edge highlight with uh with with white pure white um and then you know, like a couple of details in like black or, or gray or, or metallic, um, you, know, f- you know, flesh color, flesh. Um, but uh, and then I did uh, for bases, I did um, I did some custom um, neon uh, acrylic bases. So instead of being like a, a clear acrylic, it's a translucent neon. Um, and I scored some like you know '80s style panel lines into it and whatnot. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, garish. I mean, I'm getting I'm getting images of Thor Ragnarok in my head. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's kind of like that. It's more. It's more Tron. It's more like. Uh, it's more like psychedelic Tron. Hang on a second. I'll show you on the video. <laughs> so for the for for those of you that'll be listening to this in uh, podcast format, Benson just got up and walked away to show us something on the camera. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> because we have cameras, so we, we can do things like that. It just makes it awkward for the home listener. It does, yeah. But um, you know, while while we have a minute or two, oh, I, he's um, back. Oh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, I gotta click on his picture. That is an awesome hot pink. Oh my yeah. god! On a green neon, and <laughs> I mean. I I feel like it's uh it's time to get the energy flowing. I'm waiting for uh for what's his name to come bursting in the back door and go, "Come on, folks, let's go." That's right. The fight starts before deployment because we are going to have going to uh, uh, be assaulting your your senses. <laughs> yeah, my little. That one that one's cool. It's got it's got a rainbow star on it. I was going to say, does that have the more you know star on it? <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> in the happy face i like yeah. it yeah and then the, you know it's, it's, the whole army is just done in this style you know whether it's a uh, blue green or yellow wow that's, that's cool i um 
that's a very very startling contrast you know hot pink and then uh bright green the under hair. under armor is uh you know a black and uh, bright green hair yeah so a bit it was uh surprisingly easy to do um it took very little effort um so I, I don't really stress out about painting but uh I told myself, I'm like, I'm just going to have a couple of beers and sit down and like slap some paint, paint on these models and then, uh, you know, hit them with a really heavy, um, really heavy uh, varnish so that uh, I don't have to worry about them, you know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Was that anything like when you were painting for the Exiles game when we ran it on the live stream where you're like, you're actually, you were drinking wine at that time too. And you're like, suddenly I'm having a hard time picking out details on these models. <laughs> I have hit the point where I am officially drunk and still painting. The nice thing about the Wild West models, though, is that um, everything gets a sepia wash. That's my that's my formula. Is that uh, I, I base coat everything on the model, and then it gets a sepia wash head to toe, and then uh, just do uh, you know two two highlights with every of every color, and uh, it all looks great. Everything everything in the Wild West looks great with the sepia with a sepia wash. Well, yeah, it gives it that classic kind of like dusty. Nothing's ever a hundred percent clean look. Yeah. Except your bartenders. The bartenders are always immaculate. <laughs> They're supposed to be. So have you been working on anything other than um Blood and Plunder recently, Tim? Uh I, right now it's Oh, you well, just painted got, all your Ragnarok stuff for your for your, for your I, I your did, plunders. and now I gotta do more because uh book two is actually due by October fifth. Oh yeah, because so, you, know, you have to put it in and it's getting pretty yeah. yeah. oh, the whole pipeline issue, yeah. Yeah, so um I'm working on well, I start I've been working on book two and three. Like a lot of the, the rules are just like typed out and kind of ready to just be fleshed out into a book format. So a lot of that right now is just kind of covering okay, you know, like I'm I'm kind of writing all the additional monsters all in one just lump sum. Sure. And then I'll split it up between the books and the new powers, all one lump sum, split it up between the books. Um, and then. So you got to ration it out. Yeah. That's how yeah. we do ourselves. We, we know everything we're doing. We have all the rules. We're just like, all right, what, what are we going to slot these things into? Yeah. And I kind of know the direction that both books are going to go, you know, as far as like how it's, because I want it to be where it's like, yes, it's a supplement, but it also kind of progresses the storyline of kind of what's going on during this. That's version cool. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So, yeah. Sort of like uh, the way they do um, Frostgrave, where the supplement's going to extend the story. Yeah, yeah, and it's its own little way. Like again, it's not required. I'd like it if you buy it, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it's it's there to like add new stuff. Like you know, book two, it's already been kind of leaked out there, so I don't mind saying it. And it's my podcast. I'll do what the hell I want. But uh, book two is going to focus really on the scralings and the veneer because the veneer are not dead. You got to acquaint me with that. Um, scralings, what's that? Scralings are basically, it was a catch all term used for um, indigenous people. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So um, pseudo 11th century Native American ish. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I, I have it in my brain now. Yeah. And then, uh, and then obviously there was the two different versions of gods. There was the 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 Acer and the Veneer. The yeah. Acer are dead; they've been dead. Uh, that's actually where you're getting your god powers from is the dead Acer. Um, the Veneer, on the other hand, are alive and they kind of went hiding in Vanaheim. And so now they're going to come back out and be like, "Oh well, you know that treaty we had with the Acer over the Acer Veneer War? Yeah, that doesn't apply to you." So <laughs> you might have the powers of a god, but you uh, you don't enjoy the benefits of the of the treaty. <laughs> Right, exactly. Right. You didn't win the war. <laughs> right. So um, there's gonna be a lot of stuff like that. And then uh, obviously with the way that I wrote the the lore, like, I mean, it's going to be right in book one. And I'm going to be talking about it a little bit on the site too. But like the, the world tree toppled on its side. Well, yeah. hell and basically the realm of the dead were in the roots. Well, now the tree's toppled on its side. They can get out. So, you know, and there's a lot of, a lot of the what ifs, you know, from... Because right, the Ragnarok did not happen like the traditional version of Ragnarok. So, like, Fenris is still out there running around. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because he wasn't killed by... Ah, uh, shit. Why am I drawing a blank now? Um, Put you on the spot. Yeah, I know. 
I'm definitely going to pick up your book, though, because uh, I played the demo at Adepticon, and it is a fun game. Um, I mean, that's, that's enough. His his head is already big enough. Whatever, man. I played a lot of demos at Adepticon. <laughs> it, that one was really fun. I mean, like Ash's game, um, uh, the uh, last days, last days. Last days yeah. I, I'm like, okay, I get what you're doing. The cool rules. Uh, let's. I'll, I'll pick up the book. I'll see what the campaign system's like, and uh, I'll, I'll see if I want to give it a go. Um, like I can criticize this thing here. Like, you know, I think you got a little too much math on this thing, but, uh, it, there's some really great, interesting concepts. I want to see a little more about it, but, uh, the Ragnarok demo, I was like, obviously this is really fun. I like the way the God spark works. I'm, getting stuff. I'm, I'm doing cool, stuff, even cooler stuff to get more resources to do cooler stuff. I like it. It's, it's fast. It's fun. Um, it's, uh, got some simple mechanics. And I like I like the idea of like uh, having all your 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 pool of, uh, of of tokens for your God Spark, and you're just like making a pile and then spinning it and then get making a pile again and then spinning yeah. it again. Uh, I like that feel of it. It's very tactile, um, so I like that aspect of it a lot. Yeah. So, and I, I did have some people ask me, and I, I guess I'll address it because I know you kind of mentioned it, and some other people did. So if listeners are listening, you know, to this episode when it comes out. Or if they just decided at this point, screw it, I'm going to turn this off. Um, basically, the only time the game becomes really token heavy is when you get to the point of having like a ridiculous amount of god powers on every model. You know, because there's nothing stopping you from putting like ice and fire on a model. So it's like you can freeze people and burn them at the same time. Wait, so, wait, wait, by token heavy, are you talking about the god spark tokens? Because that's not a big deal. No, like tokens is in like, you know, this model's got ice on them. This model's, you know, oh. got a fire three. Yeah. You know, so it can get token heavy that way. But like I designed it specifically to where it's like, okay, this token does this. It lasts for a certain amount of time and it goes away. Like nothing's ever 100% permanent. Because usually at that point, you're probably dead. So, you know, <laughs> take that into consideration. <laughs> It's certainly not infinity <laughs> with all these fucking tokens. Though, I don't know. I've played enough games with Tim and even simple things that don't need tokens. Tim's like, oh, I'm going to write a token for that. And he's got these stupid little discs and he's got a permanent <laughs> marker. And if you ever try filming with Tim when he <laughs> in his token making mood, you are like, oh, my God. Because you're filming and you're thinking it's going to be really quick. I'm going to throw a token. To- no, he's like trying to write on a one inch token, a novel. That's not true. So not as soon as you enough. pause the camera, like you've given up, you're just like, fuck it. We're going to come back tomorrow. When he's, <laughs> the token. he's like, all right, let's go. It sounds like gangs of room. Like gangs of room is like, okay, we're going to have so much shit going on that we're going to make custom bases that have little insets for tiny little tokens that go onto the base. <laughs> to track whatever stuff. I mean, I don't know how the game is played. I've just seen your pictures of it, and I'm like, wait, is that does that base is that base designed to put little little things in it? So yes. it's yes, it is. But you know, like one of them is your wounds, and they um and when they when they're designed, they actually have like a little little like pool of blood that comes off the side, so it has a number, and you know, then just so you can grab it and pick it up and move it out. Oh, cool. So, so it's not like it's, you know, really, really, you know, it's not hyper finicky. Yeah. It's not, it's not like, you know, oh, you've got to try and adjust it to pull it out or anything. You've just, you've got a little tab that you can grab to change it out. So there's, so, so there's a tab that you pull out that makes a, like a widening pool of blood in the model. No, it's not a widening pool of blood. It's just, it's, it, it's just like a little blood drop so that you can grab the token to move it out. To put another one in. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, so, uh, yeah, so you're like, I grab the one and I put in a two. Yeah. yeah. And gotcha. then the other the other side of that is just where you put your gang marker in it. So if you guys are running, you know, multiple players or whatever, uh, you put okay. your color in there. Yeah, gotcha. And it, yeah. and it tracks that that's your guy. Yeah, gotcha. I thought that was another important status section. What I've always wanted to do for Exiles is to make. Uh, maybe I can get some get a buddy to do this. But I've always wanted to make a because um, in Exiles you bleed to death, right? I've always wanted to make like a, a puzzle piece pool of blood that gets this like like a set of like six tokens where like your guy is bleeding out and you put like a little a little token touching the base that has like you know it's curved to to fit the base and then it has like a little pool of blood and then you take another token the next round you put like 
you connect it to the first one and it's a bigger pool of blood. And then you, you know, you keep putting little tokens on there until the guy's dead. I've always wanted to do that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe next year. Yeah. Maybe. I'll call that, Chris. I'll call, he has a laser now, right? He's right. He's a, uh, did he find somebody? Did Chris Kohler from uh, Slow Death Games with his awesome game uh, Wild, Wild in the streets. streets? Yeah. Did he find somebody to go in and with him on a laser? Um, I don't know, but I was talking to him a little while back, and he was talking about getting some, or you know, doing some cutting. So he he either may have just decided screw it and done it himself, or um, something along those lines. I don't know. Well, it does it. I'll have Jesse design it, and uh, I'll have. Uh... I'll have uh, Chris cut it, and that'll be that'll be our our Black Friday bonus thing. We'll put we'll put uh, a six part bleeding to death token set into every Black Friday purchase or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So instead of calling it the jigsaw puzzle, it's just the jigsaw wound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because because you like the next aisles, you you bleed to death, right? And yeah. I always just like the idea of uh, of like the blood just kind of like getting bigger and grosser as you as you crawl helplessly on the table. Or in our case, just within five minutes of meeting children, shoot them in the face. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't bleed to death. They die. They just die. <laughs> Totally Context, actual... folks. It wasn't actual children. It was in the game. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was an it was an actual child in the in the context of the game. Yes. To be fair though, that child was trying to stab you to death with a jackknife. So yeah. it's yeah. You know. I mean, it, the vicious little bastard actually pulled a knife on somebody and tried to stab him. Hey, in the 19th century, it was okay for kids to uh, to have jobs like that, where they had to pull jackknives and stab intruders. You know, so it's just par for the course. You know, I mean, it, it, it's as disturbing. As that is, you have to appreciate from a historical perspective. I, I have a master's degree in history. From a historical perspective, you have to recognize that those things did happen. Yes. <laughs> a degree in history. Politicians have a degree in politics. Uh, or history. <laughs> or business. Or, or, or whatever. Or whatever. Uh, these days. It doesn't, I don't think it matters these days. You have a, you have a, Not you really. And in, in, uh, in, uh, cheating and lying. Yeah. Not to get all political, uh, but um, my uh, my favorite political quote of all time is uh, is this quote from uh, um, The Hunt for Red October. And it's a movie. It's not a real political quote. Um, where the, the Secretary of Defense, or I think he's the Secretary of State, uh, when Jack Ryan is talking to him um, uh, in, the, in the security briefing, he pulls him aside. He says, uh, I'm a politician which means I'm a thief and a liar. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's about right. It's a good movie. Book is really good, too. It was a book? <laughs> yeah, Tom Clancy. Yeah, I know. I, I say this as, a, as an avid reader who's never read a Tom Clancy novel. Um uh, yeah, it's one. It's one of like the dead spaces in my in my massive reading habit is Tom Clancy. I, I'm, I guess I guess now that I'm a dad, I can start reading it. Right? <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. Is that the requirement? Man. Yeah, yeah. Now that my kid's uh, seven years old, I should pick up uh, some some Tom Clancy novels. I'll start with The Hunt for Red October. I'll go out tomorrow. I'll get a copy of The Hunt for Red October. Okay, I'm gonna hold you to it. I will, yeah. Right now, I'm uh, I'm rereading uh, more Jim Butcher books, which is uh, sort of my bread and butter. You I know, like me some Jim Butcher. I I actually have never read a whole lot of Jim Butcher books. Kind he of... is super good at what he does. Super good. Um, I'm a big fan of the Dresden Files. Right. Uh, I hate to admit it. I'm a big fan of the Dresden Files. His uh, his other books are okay. I've read them. They're okay. Um. Uh, but uh, man, uh, very prolific and uh, you know super easy to read. Um, uh, I mean, I don't want to get into a big book review. We should be talking about games, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There should be a Dresden Files war game, is what there should be. In fact, I should maybe reach out to Jim Butcher because nowadays there's licensed properties all over the place, and I recall that there is no Dresden Files war game. No, they have uh, Fate Accelerated, the RPG, or they, they use oh, the Fate Accelerated an RPG. RPG for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there still, like, a published RPG for it that's, like, still, yeah. like, a Evil, Evil Hat Productions does it. 
uh, Evil Hat. I wonder if uh, I wonder what kind of what kind of license deal they have for it. Do you know anybody at Evil Hat? I do. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to write this on my hand and pen to contact you <laughs> about Dresden Files War Game. Dresden War Game. And if I need to, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I I'll see if you can hook me up with somebody at Evil Hat. Yeah, definitely. Because you know, exactly. never hurts to ask. People are like. Oh my God! How do they get this uh, the license for aliens, or how do they get the license for for Hellboy? I'm like, you know, they probably just asked, and some executive was like, "Oh yeah, war games, huh? Why not? <laughs> Let's talk about it." Yeah, sure. No one's ever asked before. <laughs> yeah, that's typically how the shit goes. Like I've had a lot of people ask me, like over over the course of like, you know just everything going on like off podcast, you know, like I, I've never really hidden the fact that I work in the gaming industry. People yeah. are like, well, how did, how did you guys approach asking them about that? I'm like, we just walked over to them and asked them. Yeah. And no one had asked them before. <laughs> no one had asked them before or yeah. they never asked them the right way. Well, yeah. We're asked the right way. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, um, you know, there's, there's, there's been Archer board games. Archer is in the, the, the show Archer, not an Archer war game. There's so many properties that are sort of up for grabs, uh, I, I, depending on what kind of deals they have with the other game properties. But there's so many properties that are sort of up for grabs. And, you know, it, if, you, if you think that a company like Mantic is a big company, you are fooling yourselves. It is not actually a big company. It is a very small company in the grand scheme of things. So... I, if Mantic can get a spate of licenses or Cryptozoic or somebody like that, even Cool Mini or not, which is not a gigantic company, it is within the realm of possibility for any company yeah. to get a license to a property that's not yet been licensed for the yeah. war gaming space. He's got to um, go ask. Yeah. Now, I will say it's probably going to get harder now that it's becoming more mainstream because that's some, one of the nice things. Like when I started to see licensed properties in war games, I was like, now we've made it. We're in the big time now. Now and now there's a Harry Potter war game, right? Yeah, right. So like now we're really like there's a star there's Star Wars war games. I mean there were there were back in the day, but there's just like proper Star Wars war games now. Um, we got Star Wars, we got uh, we got to Harry Potter. Once it's a proper Star Trek war game, I mean like Modiphius has its Star Trek role playing game, which has some miniatures, but there's really not a proper war game. Once we get a proper Star Trek war game, I'll know. I know war gaming really has made it. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about that trek. It's trickling down, though, right? It trickle. It's board games, right? And then yeah. war games, right? So, like everything that board games has, war games are going to get. It usually has to go through that RPG filter somewhere in there along the R- lines. RPGs first, yeah. RPG, war game, board game, war game. We're like we like we're the short end of the stick, right? We're the the last the last layer. Of uh, uh of uh, I don't know whatever it, the, yeah the, when the shit rolls downhill it, it stops at war games yeah <laughs> that's where you need to wear your hip waders <laughs> yeah we're the most the, the 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 most nerdy of all of all nerd hobbies <laughs> it's the war game wait so not only do you want to play this game you want to make miniatures out of it and you want to paint them and you want to use a tape measure to do everything. And this <laughs> and to bring it back to the industry, right? This yes. is what this is what I try to tell people about about wargaming who are like um, who uh, are, are a little bit like standoffish or exclusionary or whatever about war games or like or, or like like nerdy or like rage out about like not painting miniatures or whatever, um, or people like playing the uh, playing with with unpainted miniatures. One of the things I, I always say is like you do realize what it takes to get somebody to actually play a war game, you should be jumping for joy. If someone says that they're interested in a war game, if they want to read a 40 K novel, you should be thanking God yeah. because to get to playing a war game, you have to go through all this. Shit. It's not playing a board game. You can, you can suck. You can sucker somebody into playing a board game. Like you can, you can, you can turn somebody into a board game nerd with one game night. Right, you can be like, let's play Cards Against Humanity. Hey, let's play Small World. Hey, let's play Mice and Mystics. Ha ha ha! Now you're a board gamer. Now you're a nerd. You can do easy one night, one night in a cabin when you're camping can turn somebody into a giant board game nerd, right? But war gaming is a, there's so much of a barrier to entry because there's all this hobby aspect. You need all these tools. You need all these skills. You need like 
needing to know, learn all these esoteric rules that people aren't familiar with. Anytime anybody is interested in a war game, you should be clapping and uh, and celebrating and and, th- and figuring out what you can do to like keep that little flickering flame alive. Yeah. Because then once you can do that and you keep it going, then it's very much like that Dave Chappelle moment where you're like, gotcha, bitch, and you yeah. just hang on to them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because once once you got somebody in wargaming, they're a wargamer for life. Yeah. Nobody ever <laughs> – like, once they have two feet in, they're done. You've got them, and you can ignore them. You're like, all right, fine. Go be a wargamer. Do whatever war games you want. But we got you now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> once, once they bought a paintbrush and super glue, we got you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The moment you watch them glue the arms on a model and it goes boop onto a base and they back up and the model stands on its own. You're like, you're in now. Gotcha, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I like these uh, these miniatures heavy board games, right? Because like now, now you're like one step away, like from a from a war game. Like all I have to do is like maybe like break a model or like. like... So every time I play board games with people who aren't war gamers, I like wiggle the arms a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll fall off they'll have to buy a bottle of glue and then then we got them yeah exactly. <laughs> you know if you paint these they look really good have you have you seen the three-dimensional doors that they sell for zombie side because those are really cool yeah <laughs> and they don't take a lot of effort to paint you get some yeah. brown primer and yeah. a bit of dark sepia wash yeah, a little and spray good. paint, a little yeah. CPU wash. In fact, I have spray paint and CPU wash if you want to borrow some. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> just come right in here. Come right in this room right here. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you started. Welcome to the fold. Yeah, exactly. Pat, pat, pat. Strangely, um, uh, I, I have a, a wargaming business now, but I got into wargaming through, uh, uh, like, my friends were, like, bombarding me with it for years I was very resistant because I, it was always the miniatures. I was like, I don't want to paint miniatures. Um, it was, I mean, for, honestly, for a long time, I was, I was a really big board game nerd and role play game nerd and video game nerd and never played war games. But um, it actually started, I can trace the exact moment that I was sucked into war gaming. My buddy, Carl Keenan, I'm going to out him on the podcast. I don't think he listens to the podcast, but if you do, Carl, if you listen to the podcast, I'm outing you right now. Carl Keenan gave me a copy of um god what the fuck is it called it's uh games workshops little like uh uh narrative like like they're like short story magazine white dwarf no not white dwarf Dwarf. impact no not impact there's something else whatever he gave me this little games workshop set of short stories little magazine full of short stories and i read it and then I started reading Gaunt's Ghost novels, and then I started playing the Dawn of War games, and then I started like playing like Vassal 40k on the internet, and then I then I like bought an army, and it was all downhill from there. But it started. With- <laughs> Why don't you? Because they they try. They're like, hey, you want to play Gorkamurka? No, I have to paint miniatures. Hey, do you want to? Do you want to play more time? No, I have to paint miniatures. Hey, do you want to play 40k? No, I've got to paint miniatures. Not doing that. Why don't you just read? Infer- I think it was Inferno. Why don't you just read Inferno? All right. I'll read Inferno. I read books. Well, this is pretty cool. I like these things. Maybe I'll read some other 40K novels. Oh, great. That's really cool. Maybe I'll play a 40K video game. And that just sucked me right in. And <laughs> yeah. now, I, now I've now i I've sitting here making custom tokens for Infinity while I stare at my giant shelves of miniatures that i've produced myself <laughs> 10 years and people say i go overboard in games yes the the nice the be, the best thing about about starting my even if my room games like dies tomorrow the best thing about my room games is is that i i got my i got my game room right i got it i'm i'm showing the guys the uh, i'm panning the video around my workshop i got it yeah I had to say it's a business expense, right? Sorry, Liz, my wife. Sorry, Liz, it's a business expense. We have to do this. We have to refinish the garage and air condition it and put and paint the walls yeah. and buy shelves and build a game table. We have to do all these things because it's for the business. <laughs> and yes. now, of course, people are coming over every once a month to play Dracula's America and Infinity on my sweet-ass new game table. 
in my nice uh, my nice game room with uh, my fridge and my AC and my you know my cooler full of beers. Even better. Yeah, it was a cooler beers. last week, last month. It was a cooler because I had shit in my fridge. My dad had me put some plants or some bullshit in his fridge. My my fridge was really because I, I when I bought the house there was like a crappy outdoor fridge that I cleaned up real nice and put in the workshop. And then he renovated his house and he, my dad renovated his house. And he bought a new fridge. It was like, you want my old fridge? And I was like, well, I'll happily throw out this shitty fridge and, and use a new fridge. Uh, and so I put a new fridge in there. It was all great and happy. And then uh, uh, three months later, he was like, oh, by the way, I have all these really important seedlings that need to be refrigerated. <laughs> I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yes. I'll take all the shelves out of my nice new fridge <laughs> and now seedlings in, and I won't put any beer in my fridge for three months that you, so your seedlings can do whatever horticultural bull crap they need to do. <laughs> so the last last month we were playing, I had to be like, sorry guys, you gotta get the beer out of the cooler because the fridge has seedlings in it. <laughs> <laughs> but this month it will be full of Mountain Dew and beer. <laughs> gamer's best friend yeah that's gonna say what the hell that's awesome yeah well i so, suppose we should probably get this thing wrapping up here it's uh yeah. running long that's fine sometimes every, it happens every, every mind worm games guest appearance runs 20 minutes too long right that's, hey, that's what i do i drink too much and we, <laughs> we ramble try. for 20 20 minutes too long right that's yeah. how we do it. that is very true well nick is there anything else you want to throw in there before we close this bad boy out um no <laughs> I had to have that suspense in there. I'll I'll, I'll pretend to be Nick. <clears throat> Relic Blade is the best. Dust is awesome. Play Dust and Blood and Plunder is the coolest. Uh, y- yes. And all of those can have mushroom train from Gravelcast. All of them. That's the best thing, right? All of them. Which is why you should get the fucking mushrooms. I'm going to get those mushrooms because when I saw all the mushrooms on your table, I was like, you know what? Mushrooms can be on any game table, no matter what. Sci-fi, giant mushrooms. Subterranean, giant mushrooms. In the forest, giant mushrooms, right? Wild West, giant mushrooms. Why not? Because every Wild West game is a Weird West game anyway because if you're not playing Weird West, you're not doing it right. Right? <laughs> Basically. Right, right. Right? And so if it's Weird West, you can have giant mushrooms mushrooms the only time giant mushrooms might not be appropriate is if you're playing some dorky historical game right and they like still had gravel cast like blood, like blood and plunder <laughs> right like blood no, and plunder. They, they're just mushroom palm trees mushroom palm you solved the problem right? mushroom palm trees although i'm pretty sure the guys full of blood and plunder would be perfectly happy with mushrooms in their game full of blunder monkeys yeah, exactly <laughs> Anybody that makes a monkey, and I and I will I will maintain. Sorry to to, to, to drag you on past the twenty minute mark, but everybody anybody that makes uh, miniatures with full circular integral bases and one piece models, anybody that does that is cool with you putting mushrooms on the table. I guarantee you, because they are making no stress models, right? No stress, right? Yeah. Grab it, um, put it on the table, play it, right? <laughs> you haven't actually tried to paint one of those models. There's plenty of stress <laughs> because for one piece models, they fit a lot of detail. And when you've got like 30 or 40 or 176 models to paint, when they have 10 or 20 different little powder casings on their bandolier and the unit and then knives and swords. I was going to say buckles. And- and but, buckles, uh, but and... I forgot about the 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 the, the powder things. What do you, I, I don't even know what you call those. I, 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 should I, I, I keep looking it up and remember, or you know, not remembering, forgetting it after I look it up. There is a dead space in my historical understanding, which I will freely admit to. I, I'm, I'm an American historian. I do Native American history from like 19th century onwards, really the turn of the century. That's like my specialty. Because if you're not, if you're a historian in, the, in this day and age, you have to be like crazy focused on a, on a very specific specialty. So like turn of the century, Native American history is what I did in, in college. But there is a dead space in my historical understanding for like what the fuck those little wooden things that were hanging off of bandoliers were for. 
they had powder in them, right? But did you just like rip them off and like dump the yeah. powder in? You you open them, yeah. It's like a pre measured yeah. yeah. powder. What fucking pussy has to pre measure their powder? Um if you if you ever been, you know, trying to care. rush to do something. In the French and Indian War. Those fuckers would just put the powder in their hand, right? You just pour out powder in your hand until it looks right. You drop a ball in it. You slam that down your muzzle. What do you have to have pre-measured powder for? That's why That's why I don't understand it. I, I think that's why, why I had this break, is I don't understand why you'd need to have little pre-measured sachets of powder when you could just pour it in your hand and slam it in your muzzle and try not to die. Well, it's that whole try not to die part because their rifles exploded on them or the yeah, ball didn't whatever, go far up. enough. Yeah, it blows up. So big deal. <laughs> big deal. As a, as a war gamer, I can say big deal. He died. Whatever. It's just a little guy. It's a little guy at the table. He died. Johnson died. <laughs> in fact, when you have 30 models on the table, they don't have names. They don't have names until you have 10. Once you have 10 models on the table, they all have names. <laughs> and even then you only care about the last five maybe yeah. three <laughs> yeah 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 it's, it's, it's like you know you know uh, uh like like jimmy john and marco whatever and then like you know gump yeah <laughs> and gump two and gump three and I, I expect all the gumps to die but jimmy john i want jimmy john to live forever <laughs> i get very mad when jimmy john dies because now i have to paint a new model <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, guys. I'll let you guys go. No, that's fine. All right, folks, it's going to wrap up this episode of Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you next time. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at tim at skirmishsupremacy.com or nick at skirmishsupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.